So last week, we, we started a new series in, in the book of Ephesians. And we're just going to go chapter by chapter, walking through it. See, chapter 1, chapter 1 emphasized our possession in Christ. And chapter 2 begins to focus on our position in Christ. Because see, here's the thing. Your position always determines your possessions and your authority. I mean, think about it. The President of the United States, no matter where he goes, his position gives him the authority as the man who sits behind the desk in the Oval Office. He could be anywhere in the world, but his position gives him that authority. Well, that's the same thing we have in Christ. Our position in Christ gives us the security of everything that God promised us. That no matter what circumstances we may find ourselves in this world, our position in Christ makes sure that we always remember the truths that we find in Scripture about those who are in Christ. Does it say nothing bad is going to happen to us? Of course not. But we can live victorious no matter what we face. Hey, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he wrote it from prison. He, he, he was in a, a prison in Rome when he wrote this to church people to encourage them about who they are in Christ, to remind them, to remind us. Hey, guess what? We're on the winning team. I mean, that, that's just the truth. And God does not want us to live defeated. We don't have to know everything that's, that's coming. We already know the end of everything. That's all we need to know. Is this world a broken, messed up place? Yes. That's not a surprise. Bad things are going to happen? Yes. To good people? Absolutely. To God's people? Probably more than anything. Why? Why? Because the one who is allowed to control this world is a destroyer, is a liar. And he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to tear up God's people more than anything else. And he wants to keep as many people as possible from hearing the truth and understanding the truth that Jesus loves them and died for them. And it's the mission of the church to take that truth to a world that's so desperate to hear it. And we can do that because we live in the power of Christ who's already won the victory. We don't have to fear what the world threatens us with. That, that's why when, you know, there are certain things that if our government asks us to do, we will do. But there are certain lines we will never cross. You know, there are certain things we may do out of a, a civic sense of, of duty to try to help other people. But here's one thing. They will, never, they will never get us not to sing praises to our Savior. They're not going to tell us we can't sing. They can say it, but we're not going to do it. There are certain lines we will never cross. Why? Because we obey God rather than men. Because we belong to Him. You know, in the book, The Hiding Place, some of you are familiar with it. It's a, it's a book written by a, a woman by the name of Corey Ten Boom. And she tells the story during World, World War II times. Her and her family lived in Holland and when the Nazis began to take over, when they began to, to capture all the Jews, her and her family became part of kind of an uh, underground safety system, and they would protect Jews. They could come hide there and be protected from the Nazis that were coming to try to take them and take them away to concentration camps. But ultimately, they got found out, and her and her sister were brought to a concentration camp. And, and it was as bad as you can imagine. It was worse than you probably would imagine the conditions that they lived with every day and things were so bad that her sister didn't survive she, she didn't make it out alive 
and Corey herself was as good as dead. She had no expectations to get out alive from this concentration camp. At any given time, they were going to come and take her to the gas chamber, and her life would be over. She was a dead person walking every day. But then one day, due to a clerical error, she was accidentally freed. And, and she, was, she was released. Snatched from the jaws of death, she was given her life again. Winston Churchill said that there's nothing quite so exhilarating as being shot at and missed. And that must have been how Corey Tim Boone felt. She was dead, but yet she lived. See, when we're born, when we're born into this life, we are born spiritually dead. We are dead in our sin. But the beautiful part about God's truth is that even though we were dead in our sin, God came on the scene and said, I'm, I'm not going to leave you that way. I've come so that you can live. See, that's what God does. He brings dead things to life. And that's what chapter 2 of Ephesians talks about. That's why it's such an incredible picture of what God has actually done. And when we, we look at it on paper, and, and we look at the magnitude of the fact that we're not just bad people, we're not just sinful, broken people. When we're born into sin, we're dead. We are dead people walking until God stepped in and transforms us in a way that only He can. That's the beauty of this truth. So let's start. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. Look what it says. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the crazy cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. See, in chapter 1, Paul begins to, to list all of God's spiritual blessings to us and he, he prays that we would fully begin to understand them, that we would comprehend them, that we'd be enlightened to the truth by God now one of those spiritual blessings he talks about is the forgiveness of sin, the redemption we have through Christ, and then in chapter 2 he goes into that in more detail, exactly what has Christ done for us that we were spiritually dead separated, alienated from God because of our sin And then what did Christ do for us? Because he, he starts out by describing who we were in our sin. I mean, look what he said. He said, we followed the ways of this world. That is, we live according to a non-Christian value system, just like the world says. We pursue the things of the world. We, we pursue the things that we think we ought to. And see, that value system is created and energized by Satan. That's what he said. He said, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That refers to the devil. See, Satan, in his craftiness, places things in front of us that we, in our sinful condition, find attractive. And therefore, we pursue those things. We begin to live in pursuit of the ideal. Better jobs, more money, bigger house you know the American dream we've all been taught that is what we're supposed to do provide for our family and do the best we can and get all you can and can all you get and sit on the can I mean that, that's it that's what we're taught Satan's kingdoms his kingdom encourages us to have an ungodly value system and pursue things that may seem good but in fact with all they do they're put in front of us to pull us away from the right thing and that's that's a godly pursuit 
then you have this incredible word that makes such a difference when you find it in scripture it's a little three letter word that changes everything it's the word but and whenever God butts in you better pay attention because something big's happening look what he says in verse 4 it says but because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions it is by grace you have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus God's mercy restrains his wrath what we deserve we don't have to endure we don't have to receive why because of God's great love for us while we were dead in our sin God stepped in and said I love you too much to leave you there it doesn't have to be that way and these verses tell us three things that God did for us it says first he made us alive with Christ our sins made us spiritually dead they separated us from God but the resurrected Christ overcame death and in him we have the power that overcame death as well and secondly it says he raised us up with Christ life in Christ came because we experienced a spiritual resurrection while we were dead in our sin God made us new he raised us to new life that's why we say that when we baptize people buried with Jesus in baptism raised to new life in Christ that's what that means we were raised up to have a new life as the Bible says became a new creation that's what Christ did for us and third it says he seated us with him in the heavenly realms and that is he made possible and he made certain our future resurrection with him in heaven that one day we will be where he is and we will be with him and it's a, a beautiful picture and a, an incredible truth that so often I think we, we we think about but we don't think about it in the way that we should we don't really think of the fact that we were dead in our sin Jesus didn't die to make good people better or to make bad people good he died to bring dead people back to life I mean it's so much greater than we often think about it and that's what Paul's trying to get us to understand who we are in Christ is so much bigger than we often consider it Jesus didn't die so we could come to church or we could have a church service or we could meet three times a week he died so we could give our lives for him And part of God's intention, in addition to the, the, the natural response of his love for us being shown in his death on our behalf for our sin, is to show for all of eternity the magnitude of his grace for us. And that's why he said, back in verse 6, he says, verse 7, in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace that word show in the original language actually is the word display that he might display the incomparable riches of his grace through us we are that display we are on display as living examples of the grace of God and we will be on display for all of eternity because we will be with him for all of eternity. That's what he's saying right there. And then we go into verse 8. 
which if you've been in church, you've heard this. If you've been to vacation Bible school, you've heard this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Beautiful. That's some of the most beautiful truth we find in all the Scripture. The grace of God. It is by grace that we've been saved. What, what does that mean? It means it had nothing to do with us. It means that God did not re, was not required to offer us salvation. He was not required to give us any option to escape the penalty that we actually deserved for our own sinfulness, which is death. He would have been perfectly justified in saying, they sin, they pay for it, that's it. But in his grace, in his infinite mercy, because he loved us that much. That's what John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It is his grace alone that saved us. It was at his initiative. He initiated it. He did it. He finished it. No part of that is credited to us. All we do is, is hold out a hand and grab the hand that's constantly reaching out from God. That's it. He pulls us out from death. He sets us in new life. We bring nothing to the table. Nothing. None of us. It is the gift of God. And I love this picture when he talks about in verse 10. And he's referencing back to the fact that he said we were going to be his display. He was going to put us on display. Why? Because we were his workmanship. And that word actually has at its meaning not just physical labor, but it's the result of artistic skill and craftsmanship. We, God's people, are works of art created by God for his pleasure and for his good works. And it, and it all flows together. You know, it says in verse 10, we are creating in Christ Jesus to do good works for which he prepared in advance for us to do. And the way that works, this does not mean we do a good work for God. It means that God does a good work through us when we are faithful and obedient to him. See, that's how it all works together. It's all initiated by God. The good works come that God prepared for us to do is when we're simply living in obedience to him, we fulfill the plan that God has already laid out for us. But it all came from God. Everything starts from God. That's why we need to understand this. And that's why living in a season like 2020, in, in a year that's just been all kind of crazy, we say, you know what? This didn't surprise God. God knew this was coming. And God has a plan for it. I believe that a year from now we're going to look back in five years from now we're going to look back and 2020 is going to be seen as an incredible blessing on so many people because of the good that's going to come out of it that doesn't mean it's not difficult now of course it is but what God can do is he takes what the enemy intended for bad and he turns it into something good he uses it for his purposes, for his glory. 
and I, I think the church is going to come out of this on the other side stronger and more focused and more on mission than we have seen in a long time and I think that is one of the greatest things one of the greatest outcomes that we could ever see out of a season like this let's go to verse 11 look what it says and I've told you this before oftentimes when when we talk about God always seems to it's almost like a coincidence that God will speak about something that touches things that are going on in the world well this is another one of those times look what it says in verse 11 it says therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentile by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision which is done in the body by human hands remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Well, apparently there was some friction going on that Paul felt the need to address in the Ephesian church between the Jews and the Gentiles. To the point where even something like circumcision became a derogatory thing where they would call them uncircumcised people as a slur, as a, a racial bad word. And Paul felt the need to address that. But look at what he says. The state of the Gentiles were. In verse 12, he says, they were separate from Christ. They were excluded from citizenship in Israel. They were foreigners to the covenant of the promise. They were without hope. They were without God in the world. then the beautiful part just like us he says you were you were so far away from everything but then he says once again but now in Christ Jesus you who were once far away have been brought close by the blood of Christ he said you were foreigners and yet in Christ he brings all things together. Let's keep reading. Look what it says in verse uh, 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Christ is the one who gave us peace with God for he himself is our peace. And right there, he's talking about people who had for centuries hated one another, the Jews and Gentiles. And they had erected walls up. You know, there was even a wall in the temple that said, hey, if you, Jews, only Jews can go past this place. Even if you were a Christian and wanted to worship, you still had certain parts of the temple that you could go in and certain parts you could not based on your ethnicity. I've heard of that. I've heard of that happening since then. It wasn't right then and it's not right now. But that's the beauty of this. It said it right there. It said Christ abolished those walls. Every dividing line between humanity, between humankind, was torn down by Christ. And every person, every color, every creed, every nationality was made one in our need for a Savior. No one was above anybody else. And that's what Jesus did. We put up barriers, he breaks them down and says, that's not how I want you to live. I don't want you to see each other as different because you're not different. 
you're all one under the gospel. You're humans. It doesn't matter the shade of skin tone you have. Anything that, that divides is not from God. We in our sinfulness do that. God always brings things together. We were divided. We were broken. We were alienated from God. Jesus' death knocked out that divide and built a bridge. When we're divided from each other through earthly hostilities, the death of Christ reconciles those relationships. He reconciles us first to him and then us with each other. That's the way God desires. That's true reconciliation. The truth is, the church should be the world's most racially integrated community. And we know, sadly, that's not the case. But maybe that's something that can change. Because God says we're all part of one family. We're all fellow citizens of God's kingdom, period. He, he doesn't put a, put a descriptor on that of color. There's no identifiers. We're fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. Race or nationality make no difference. And this is all just a beautiful picture of the, the entire trinity of God at work. I mean, think about it. We, we see it in those few verses. It says, Jesus preached the message of peace. He brought peace to the Jews and Gentiles. With the cross, he reconciled them to each other. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to everyone who believes. See, the, the Father developed the plan for salvation through faith by grace. The Son carried out that plan by living a perfect sinless life and dying on the cross. And then the Spirit became the means that we access God through Christ. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at work together. To what end? Well, look what it says, starting in verse 19. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. So Paul moves into this metaphor that declares both Jews and Gentiles were building blocks, stones of this building. And these stones are forming a, a living spiritual temple to glorify God. In the Old Testament, that temple was the literal dwelling place of the Spirit of God. You went to the temple to meet with God. He wasn't anywhere else. But in the New Testament, God's not in a stone temple, but he's in the hearts of all believers. We are the temple. And Christ is that, that unifying factor that takes all those stones and makes something brand new makes his temple through us one family God's family God's kingdom we were dead in sin but God in his grace said I don't want to leave you that way I wanted you to get, have a way to have life not just life here but life for all of eternity that's the beauty of Ephesians 2 it tells us that story that basically summarizes the entire Bible right there. That we were dead in sin. We were born dead in our sin. But then Christ came up on the scene. And because of what he did, he died on the cross and he rose again. And that made a way for us not to die in our own sin. He did it for us. And that's the whole Bible. We put our trust in that. By grace we have been saved through faith. See, it's through faith we say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and he rose again. By faith, I say, I need that. I know I'm a sinner. And I know that 
if I have to pay the own, my own price for my own sin, then I'm going to spend eternity separated from God. Because if, if I die in my sin, I have to die for my sin. And I don't get to use the payment that's already been paid, which is Jesus. But in faith, I receive that free gift and say, I choose Jesus. I want to make him part of my life. I want him to give me a fresh start to bring something that was dead bring to life as only he can do. See, there might be some of you watching today, there might be some of you here today that that's where you're at right now. You know that, hey, you're living as a dead person, dead in your sin because there's never been a time in your life where you've said, I'm ready to put my faith in what Jesus did. I'm ready to trust in what the Bible said that I'm a sinner deserving of death but then Jesus came along and he died for my sin so that I don't have to and in him I can have forgiveness of my sin and I can have life see the Bible says in Romans it says all you have to do is is actually receive that free gift it says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved that's it why because it's not about you you don't earn it so you don't have to do anything to get it other than to receive it it's it's being held out for every person whether you're in the room whether you're watching online that's your opportunity today to find real true life don't miss it right now we're getting ready to sing and this is your time to respond just to to do business with God. There may be some things. You you just want to be at your seat. You might just want to pray. Some of you might say, you know what? I'm I'm one of those people that I need to make Jesus a part of my life. I need to receive his gift of salvation. You can do that today. You can go to our website, marshallroad.church. And there's a button right on the front that just says yes. You can get to it by going to marshallroad.church forward slash yes. And if you're here today, if you're online watching, and you say, I'm somebody that needs to make a decision to accept Christ, then go to that webpage and let us know that that's what you want to do. And we'll reach out to you as soon as we get your message. And we'll, we want to answer any questions you might have. If you're in the building and you say, I want to do that right now, then, hey, when we're singing, come talk to me. I'll, I'll be standing right up here. Don't wait. This is your time. Do whatever God is leading you to do. Let's pray. Father. We-